The first reading is Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continue to say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, and for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. We thank the Lord for his precious word. Our second lesson is from the New Testament, Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm also circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, Indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore let us, as many as mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. 
Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk, as you have for us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Amen. I want to speak on part of Philippians chapter 3. And the particular emphasis will be on verses 8 to 12. But I wanted to put it in its context, which is why we read the whole chapter. Of all the people that we meet in the Bible, there can be few who can, shall we say, legitimately say, I'm qualified in all this and this and this. But it was as if he, he ticked all the boxes as far as the legal side was concerned. But he says this amazing thing, that he counts them all as loss. One translation says uh, it's rubbish. Fancy all this. These qualifications he had, some of which he was born. And he never mentioned that there was something else which was, in his day, very valuable. He was born a Roman citizen. But that didn't concern the Jews particularly. And he was just talking about the Jewish aspect. And we must never forget that contrary to so many people thinking that uh, once Saul had his meeting on the Damascus Road with Jesus, he somehow not only became a Christian, but he changed his name. And it's not true. He was Saul to the Jews. And he was Paul to the Gentiles who'd been around. And of course, he became the apostle to the Gentiles. And he was continued to be known as the Paul. But there wasn't this abdication of his Jewishness at all. And it's a great parallel between the way people look at Jesus and the way that we should look at Paul. And it is this, that both of them were completely certain. Paul was from the ordinary human point of view. Jesus was because he was the author through which all things were made that were made as it says in John's Gospel. Both of them were not only Jewish, but were conforming completely to God's concept of the Jewishness. A lot of what went on in Israel had sullied the Jewish faith there was a lot of corruption. But he had remained throughout a Jew. He was born a Jew. He died a Jew. Just the same as Jesus. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Paul, 
always remained a Jew, but saved by grace. In his letter to the church of Philippi, he addresses them in a very interesting way. And it says this in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 1. To all the saints in Christ. And that is important. Paul was talking to people who were in Christ. And it wasn't just a form of words, and he was certainly a very educated man. But he meant every word of it. The complete Jewish Bible says this in slightly different words, which, in fact, emphasise the Jewishness of the Scripture even more. But the meaning's the same, that of being in Christ or united with the Messiah. In this particular verse, both translations use either Jesus or Messiah as well. So they, they're meaning exactly the same. And when we come to chapter 3, it should be obvious to us that the relationship that Paul has with the Lord is not merely knowing about God or about Jesus. It's far deeper than that. And sadly, in the Western world in particular, there are so many who claim to be Christians, yet they do not seem to understand the simple fact that going to church alone is what God wants. Now, I'm not encouraging anyone to stay at home, but merely attending a building is not the same as a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can attend a meeting every day of your life, but it will not save you. It doesn't save anybody at all. And the same goes for what is known as infant baptism. So many people think that by sprinkling water on a child, that child, when it grows up, is a Christian. It's rubbish. Anybody who doubts that, I just give one simple instruction. Read your Bible. Don't believe the words of men and traditions of churches. Read your Bible. See what it says. It may shock you. Because Jesus said it all in John chapter 3. We must be born again. We must be born again. To have this relationship with Jesus and be united with him, the Jewish Messiah. And it's important that we never forget that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and he is coming back for his people. If we had a grasp of the scripture that Paul had, and here I have to admit, there are two aspects of this. That One is that he spoke Hebrew. And the second is that in any situation throughout the world, it's very difficult to understand truly the culture of another country, of another people. Even in this country, England, some countries might think that all, <clears throat> all people over there, they're the same culture. They're not. They vary a lot. And there are some things that can be said in one part of the country, which is said in another one, they'd probably be highly offended. Culture is a very strange thing. It's far more 
a problem, I believe, than things such as racism, because it's amongst people even of the same color. But for us to get into the being, the mind of Paul is very difficult because he was Jewish, he spoke Hebrew, and most of us don't, and he was also of a different culture. And things which he would have seen in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, and he wouldn't have needed any explanation. We very often have to go to a, a very good commentary to dig out some of these details which otherwise would have just passed us by. And so understanding where Paul was coming from in its deepest sense is a bit of a problem for us. But one thing was certain. The Apostle Paul left Jerusalem as an Orthodox Jew on a mission to destroy the early church. He'd got letters of authority. But before he got there, he had met Jesus Christ, who appeared to him. And his life was changed in a moment. And from then, he, the persecutor, became on the receiving end of the persecution because he realized that this person, Jesus, was risen from the dead. He had seen the Lord and he was a changed man. He was now born again. In Philippians chapter three, he warns particularly about deceivers at the beginning of the chapter. And we see them all around us today. And there are many who are denying basic biblical truths. There are others who are preaching a false gospel. And in doing this, in verse 3 of chapter 3, he launches into what is the key of our relationship. It cannot, I believe, get any deeper or greater than what he states here. It is being in Christ. It is not just knowing about Christ. It's in Christ. Or united with Christ, the Messiah. Being in Christ governs all his thinking and his attitudes. And as we read in other letters by Paul, his attitude is always that of in Christ alone. There's no other way, no other addition. It's just in Christ. And we can see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 30 and 31. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21. In addition, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, we find that we are a new creation. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, we find that we have been brought near and that he himself is our peace. So we can see that being in Christ is at the centre of a believer's relationship with the Lord, our Lord. Now all this is, may I suggest, straightforward, but in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 12, Paul moves into what I would call a personal testimony of what he sees going on his relationship and this is the center of what I wish to bring to you tonight and I'm just going to 
read those few verses again. Beginning in verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. It's essential we understand that all worldly matters, everything around us, church positions, etc., we have to look at them as Paul did. And that is that really they're worthless. And the question is, why? Well, in verse 8 is the answer that we've just read. It's that I may gain Christ. Nothing must come in the way. There are people, many, many people in this country who are living comfortable lives and never set a foot within the house of God. They're satisfied. They have all that they want in the world. And that is their problem. They don't see their need. And very often when it's drawn to their attention, they don't want to know. But we cannot save anyone. But we can tell them. One of the things is that the worldly things which we so treasure, I'm not talking about necessarily expensive things, but the things that we like, if we think about it, they won't be in heaven. There's no need for them. Many of the things, daily tasks we undertake will not be done in heaven. There's no mention in the Bible about money in heaven. Very little is actually said about heaven, except the whole place is full of the glory of God. It is Christ alone who saves us. And there are two things I want to emphasize in verse nine that we just read. And be found in him, and in verse 10, that I may know him. But it's essential we realize that the start of all this is, we must be born again. In John chapter 3, verses 3 and 7, you must be born again. But Paul emphasizes that we have to continue on this journey. It is no good thinking that because we are born again, we've arrived far from it. We've just started on the journey. And this is what he's on about when he says later on, I press on. And he emphasizes it a great deal. We need to continue the journey to pursue or press on in Philippians 3.12. And one thing is certain, at no point in a Christian's life have we ever arrived and can sit down and have a rest. We've only arrived when this life is over. It's been more apparent in recent years that Christians are more reluctant to challenge people with the full gospel message. 
I've noticed it. I expect you have as well. More likelihood of someone inviting you to come to our church rather than saying, are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your saviour? Because only the latter is the true gospel message. You can invite them to come to church, but what are they expecting? They may or may not know. But the challenge is what seems to have faded out in the Western world generally. And I've noticed it a great deal over the last 50 years. The whole gospel. And the Apostle Paul was careful, which we read it in Acts. He says, I have not neglected to bring to you the whole counsel of God, the whole mind of God. And we should be doing the same. If we are in Christ, we should have that same mind about what our commission is. You see, there's only one way of salvation. And it is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It is by repentance and accepting his atoning death on that cross. And a determination to walk his way, not our own. God made the provision. But we have got to make the decision. That is our starting point. And it's no use encouraging people to press on if they haven't been at that starting point. If we water down the gospel message, we're going to end up with a watered down church. And it wouldn't take long to do it either. It's nice to have churches which are full of people, but if they're not being taught, where's it all going? How do we stand? Are we pressing on? Have we that desire to see people reached with the gospel? It's not our message. It's Christ's message. It was described as the Great Commission. And it wasn't a request. He said, go. He didn't say, please, go. And he told us that the world was before us. If we are believers, we know that we are on our way to glory. We are safe in God's hands. But there's no question about taking an easy way out. We're here as workers in his vineyard. We are here to do his bidding. And we should always be, as I see Paul, be people with a mission, a mission to reach people with the good news because there's no other way. That mission is to reach the lost. We are not here to be nice people, having nice services and just messing about. The gospel message is a serious message and it needs a determined approach from each person. We must give it everything and we must not flag or give up or else the Great Commission will be our great omission. And then well, what will the Lord say to us? Because it's his business we've been about. How we individually approach our witnessing will differ. We're all different. It doesn't matter. But the question for everyone is the same. 
Are we ready? Are we available? And are we committed wholeheartedly? Because that is what the demand is. It's no good being half-hearted. We've only got to look at Paul, the things he endured, shipwrecks, beatings, left half dead, tramping all round that area of the, the Roman world. He didn't have an easy time, friends. He wasn't just going round like a travelling salesman. He was a man with a mission. A mission to reach the lost. If we are Jesus' disciples, then we must press on. As the Apostle Paul said in verse 12, I press on. He's not giving up, and we must not give up. Let us press on in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring to completion the task which Jesus has given to each one of us. We must be people with a passion for the lost. It doesn't require anything out of the ordinary from what should be expected of a believer. We either believe that what Jesus achieved on that cross was so precious that the Great Commission was an obvious thing to say. Go to reach the people, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. It's not something casual that we're taking on, not something optional. And we need to be people who see the lost from God's viewpoint. Not just lost as a name, but they are lost. And unless they come to faith, hell will be their destination. And the message is to tell them the whole gospel as per the scriptures here. But there's one thing, particularly in our generation, we've got to avoid. And that is watering the gospel down to make it more appealing. I don't see anything about Paul aligning itself with the very often soft way of presenting the gospel of just telling people God loves you. And the reason's quite simple. It wasn't that Paul didn't know that. It was that he knew that God loving them wasn't their problem. Their problem was they were God's enemies and they were against him. And he God had made a way of escape. So it isn't enough to tell them that God loves them, but to tell them just where they stand in God's eyes and the fact that he has made provision to deliver them from the powers of darkness and establish them in his kingdom. It's God's message. It's not ours. And he's given us not only the task, but the privilege of taking that message to others. A message that we must be in Christ, firmly rooted in Christ, and we must never give up. We must be those who carry on to the end of our days to reaching out to the lost. Amen. Amen.